how good it is to be together again, to honor God and to spend some time in his word and to spend some time really looking at what he has to say to us to this morning. Good to see you here. Thank you for joining us here this Sunday morning. And, and I believe God's got some, something to say to you today. He wants to encourage you and he wants to reveal more of his word to you today. I'm wondering when you think about your years of working, maybe some of you more than others, I'm wondering if you ever got a raise at work. I'm wondering if you never got a raise. Now, there's something really nice about a pay increase, and I'm not in any way asking for it, but, it, but there's a, something nice that happens, or, or another change in your contract for the better. So, for example, maybe after working for a company for a while, they give you some new benefits, and you're like, yeah, that's awesome. I can finally get these teeth fixed, or whatever it may be. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's good when we can enjoy the blessings of work. I was talking talking to someone a couple of weeks ago and they said they remember when they would get 25 cents 25 cents an hour for babysitting and they're like woohoo look at all the money that we uh, we have made i'm thinking Getting 25 cents an hour probably is not going to cut it for most of us here today. But, but it's cool that when we've got a good contract at work, a contract that honors us in, in our job, it's even cooler when we've got a good contract in life, a contract that or a, a covenant, as, as the Bible calls us, that is way, way better than any other financial uh, remuneration or anything that we can get in life. And see, God's got a much better contract than any, any union could ever give you. A contract, a superior contract that will bless us in our walk with him. We're going to look at that this morning here from Hebrews chapter 8. But let's start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you again that we can take time in your word. Thank you that you speak to us, that you reveal yourself to us. And now, God, help us to understand how this passage re relates to us and where we are at in our walk with you. Speak to us clearly. It's my prayer again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When we look at a, a superior contract, we've got to understand we have, first of all, a superior supervisor. Hebrews chapter 8. Let's jump there this morning. And, and I just want to say, you, you probably noticed, we kind of went from Hebrews 6 to Hebrews 8. Now, Hebrews 7 is an incredible portion of Scripture that talks about a great man by the name of Melchizedek. And uh, Pastor Lewis, uh, a couple of weeks ago, he talked about that. So I thought, you know what, let's, let's move on to chapter 8. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 says this. The point of what we're saying is this. We do not have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Now, let me remind you something. Let me remind you back then they had something called the high priest. Now, here's a, a picture of, of the, uh, the high priest in the tabernacle that we saw in Israel. And, of course, it's just a mannequin, okay? But uh, he was a superior, uh, supreme religious leader of Israel who, who oversaw all the other priests. He had some incredible responsibilities. He was the only one that was able, as you saw in the picture, to wear this breastplate which was called the, the Urim and Thummim. The Urim and Thummim had different stones in there that were like, like dice, and they were used to determine truth and falsity. Uh, for this reason, the Hebrew people would come to, to the priest and they would seek wisdom, they would seek direction and spiritual direction. He had a lot of responsibility. He would make sure the temple was taken care of on a daily basis, and his most important duty was to, to conduct the service once a year on the Day of Atonement. We've talked about this before, but the Day of Atonement was the one day in the year where he was allowed to go into the Holy of Holy, the most holy place, and offer blood from a sacrificed animal for the sins of the entire nation. By the way, they still uh, celebrate uh, the Day of Atonement today. That's called Yom Kippur, and this year it will be celebrated on October 11th, 2024. So, so again, he had a really important uh, uh, responsibility. But the truth is that he has nothing, 
nothing on Jesus. See, the, the, the high priest, he messed up. The high priest, he tripped up. The high priest, he screwed up. And, and just like the rest of us, he didn't get it right. And he made many mistakes. But Jesus never did. Jesus was always within out sin. And in Jesus' time, there was a, a high priest by the name of Caiaphas. Here's a picture of Caiaphas. We went back into time and got a picture of him. And this is what he looked like. Well, maybe not so much. This is a, a picture from the Passion of the Christ. But, but this guy, Caiaphas, was, uh, was not, a, not a fan of Jesus. And I'll explain that in just a second. He was a member of the uh, Jewish sect called the Sadducees. Now listen, I'm so glad I'm not part of the Sadducees. And I'll tell you why in a second. See, the Sadducees, are, they're very wealthy guys at the time, wealthy leaders. They were uh, people that had high political positions. And uh, what the Sadducees did is they had a, a seat of majority in the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the Jewish high court. So uh, this guy, Caiaphas, he was a leader, a, a high distinct leader of this Jewish high court for 18 years. But here is the problem with the Sadducees. In terms of theology, man, these guys, they were sad, you see. You, you get it, Sadducees. They were Sadducees. Yeah, I tell you why. Because they didn't believe in, in the afterlife. They didn't believe in the existence of the spiritual world, angels, demons, and all that stuff. And I'm sitting there, what did they believe? You know, how sad was it to be part of these guys, uh, this, this sect? Well, anyways, this, the high priest in the time of Jesus was one of these guys, part of the Sadducees. He was the high priest and he did not like Jesus, not one bit. And the reason being is that because Jesus was becoming more and more popular, he, Jesus was out there. He raised Lazarus from the dead and, uh, and he was doing all sorts of miracles. And Caiaphas is going, what is the deal here? This is not okay. He's taking some of the attention away from me. And, and the truth is he's acting like a high priest. And who does he think he is act, acting like a high priest? I'm the high priest. I am Caiaphas. The high priest, he had to come from the lineage of Levi. I mean, that's just the, that's Aaron's, Aaron's lineage. And, and who is this guy? He didn't even come from that lineage. He, he came from the lineage of Judah. Judah, like, how can he call himself somebody like a high priest? And, but the neat thing is, Judah's lineage was the lineage of Abraham and David. He was not from the lineage of law like the Levites were. He was from the lineage of promise. He was the lineage that, that brought in the hope and the, the great things that God has for us. Caiaphas, the high priest, didn't like him, and he prophesied that he should be killed, John 11, verse 50. And in the end, he, of course, he, he gave his assent to Jesus being killed. If you, uh, if you think about Jesus in comparison to the high priest, what a complete difference. Jesus being one that was with the people, that loved the people, that understood the eternal, that understood the spiritual world. Jesus is the one that, that did something incredibly awesome. See, if you, if you were to go back in, in that time period, and if you were to go into the tabernacle that was set up, one of the things you would not find in the tabernacle is nice padded seats or nice padded couch like you're probably sitting on right now. You, you didn't find that because see, here's the thing. The high priest position, his, his job was never completed. He was constantly working and doing things in the tabernacle. But the interesting thing here is that Jesus, if you go back to our scripture here from Hebrews, it says that, that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne of of God. See, Jesus completed the work that was to be completed. He didn't, he was, he's not pacing around heaven trying to figure things out. No, no. He sat down because it was done. We have a superior supervisor who, who is, is so much better than anyone else on the planet. Psalm chapter 110 verse 1 says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. See, Jesus, and I, I preached on this before, Jesus sat down, he put his feet back up, he put his feet on the enemy's neck like they used to do when, the, uh, uh, when, when a person conquered a nation. They would take the, the 
the people that were the prestigious ones, make them lay down in the, and the soldiers would put their feet on their neck as a, as a way of, of showing dominance. Well, Jesus overcame all evil. And he is our supervisor who takes care of us. We have a superior supervisor. We also have a superior env environment. We, we, we have better gifts through Jesus. Verse 3 says, Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. Hey, let's go back for just a minute. I started by talking about contracts and work and all, all that stuff. Let, let, years ago, I used to work for a company called Amigo Building Supplies. We used to pack drywall and, and, and sell all sorts of building supplies and stuff. And that's how I put myself through college at the time. And my boss at the time was my uncle, actually, who is now with Jesus. But my uncle made it a big, big point to honor his employees, especially at Christmas time. Christmas time was awesome. He, we'd get a turkey, we'd get chocolates, we'd get a special gift, we'd get a bonus, and then he'd take us all out for, for a great lunch at Mr. Mike's. I don't know if you ever remember Mr. Mike's, and he'd have a steak. Oh, my, my mouth is salivating when I think about how, how well he treated us at the time. And you know what? Compare that to other jobs. Man, I was just happy to get a paycheck. Not, none of this other stuff. It's nice when you are treated and given gifts and, and blessed as an employee. See, the high priest's responsibility, going back to the scripture, was to bring the people's sacrifices and stuff, not to them, to bless them, but to God and to honor God. And, and see, the thing was, the gifts that he brought to the temple was not something that, would, that God would take a look at and say, okay, great, those gifts are awesome. Now all your sins are, are gone. They're forgiven. No, no. What it would do, it would just be a covering for sin. It would never take away our sins. But, you know, Jesus, Jesus does something absolutely fantastic. He doesn't just give us, bring gifts to God on our behalf, but he brings gifts from God to us to bless him. He was one, the one that brings us a, a much greater blessing than any other priest or any other person could bring. If you look at uh, his lineage, his lineage is one of promise, not one of the law that we have to abide by the law. Verse 4, it says, if, you, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest for there is already men who offer the, the gift prescribed by the law. The men he was talking about, again, were the, the, the priests who had, had to constantly bring sacrifices to God. And, and, and they, they didn't allow, they didn't allow a full relationship with God. But Jesus brought us to a place that we have that full relationship with the Father. There, there, there's blessings from obeying the law. Okay, let's be honest. If you obey the law, and you know, you know, in our context, if you obey the law, there is a, you can go drive on the roads and, and you can drive without worry as far as a, um, if you keep your, you know, your speed limit down to the proper speed. Of course, we all do that, right? And then we won't get a speeding ticket. You know, you've got, there's some blessings, uh, but, but uh, uh, you know, there's, there's other blessings that we could receive that are above the law. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be awesome if you ever got pulled over by a cop and you were to tell them, listen, I just want you to know that, uh, that you may be pulling me, off, pulling me over for driving on this road, driving too fast, but I know the guy that made this road. Well, not just the road, the guy that made the ground on which the road stands. The police officer probably wouldn't give you a, a, a free pass and, and let you pass as far as no tickets. But the point is God gives us not just these temporal blessings that comes from uh, obeying the law, but he gives us a blessing of enjoying him, the creator of all things. He brings us better gifts. He brings us to a better home. Verse 5 says, They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. Again, he's talking about the priest who served in the earthly temple on, uh, in, in Jerusalem at the time. This temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. This temple has nothing 
on what God has for us someday in heaven. It says it is just a shadow. Now, I don't know if, you, if you've ever seen a shadow. A shadow is an interesting thing. It, it gives you sort of an idea of, the, of an object, but it doesn't give you the full picture. I, I'll give you some examples of some shadows. So here's a shadow, and you look at it and you go, well, that's a very pretty kitty cat. But if you go to what the picture is, it's actually a, the shadow of a dog. Or, or this shadow is a beautiful piano that uh, you see there uh, before you. But realistically, it's a shadow of a, of a railing, which is quite pretty cool actually and this one here obviously a couple they're they're getting very close and personal and about to kiss each other but real realistically you know the shadow is of two people walking uh, beside each other or this one here a shadow of a of a guy hanging on a uh, on I guess on a stake of some sort but realistically it's a shadow of a of a street sign or, or this one, a shadow of a wolf. I mean, that's pretty scary stuff. Realistically, it's a shadow of this dog. Or, or this, is, this is probably one of my favorite. It's a shadow of a heart uh, um, being cast out. Well, realistically, it's just, just my wife. Okay, I put that in there just for fun. It's not really a shadow of her. But, but anyway, I thought I'd just have a little bit of fun here this morning. The point is, shadows can be deceptive. They don't give you the full picture. They don't show you really what is behind uh, that thing making the shadow. And see, when you look at what we have on this planet, when we, you look at, at uh, he's talking about the, the tabernacle or the temple and all the, the extravagance of that. He's, what, what the writer is saying is, man, if that's just a shadow. That's just that's so small comparing to the blessings that God has for us in heaven the blessings of what is awaiting for us. And can I just be straight up with you? Heaven is not going to be boring. I, I, a couple of weeks ago, we were together with, uh, I, I do what is called church renewal on a Thursday morning. And I was together with a bunch of pastors. And we're talking about, about heaven and heaven being a kingdom. Now, let me be, some, be very clear with you today. Heaven is not going to be a place where you're going to be sitting on a cloud eating cream cheese. You know the commercials from way back when on Philadelphia cream cheese. No, no, we will be active. We will be working, not, not laboring and, and, and in a difficult situation. But the scriptures tells us one example, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3 says, we will be judging the angels. We will be serving God in a perfect, fulfilling environment. It's not going to be boring. God has got some incredible stuff waiting for us. And sometimes we get so caught up in the shadow, in what we see around us and wanting more and more and more of this planet and God says man you're missing it this is just a shadow comparing to the blessings that are coming for us we, our superior contracts brings us a much better environment thirdly our superior contract brings us better blessing it brings us new covenant blessings let's read verse 6 but the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as a covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one. It is found on better promises. Now, now let me stop here for just a minute and let me explain once again what the word covenant means. Covenant is an agreement or, 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 or a, a commitment that two parties make. The, the writer is talking about a working arrangement that God had with his people Israel. He had chosen them for a very special relationship and he had chosen them from all the other people on this earth. L let me interject and just say this here this morning, folks. God still looks at Israel as his chosen people, as his chosen nation. And, you know, I, I, I get very, very upset at what's going on in our society today. The amount of anti-Semitism that is going on is absolutely disgusting. The amount of stuff that is being said today because of the conflict that is going on in Israel. People are buying into everything the media is saying and they are not taking time to do a little bit of research to find out really what's, getting, what's going on there. I would challenge you 
to do a bit of more research than what the media is feeding you. Because a lot of the stuff that you are seeing on TV has been fabricated. There are things that are just not true. Is the war going on? Absolutely. Are innocent people dying? Absolutely. But this is not a war of Israel against Palestine. This is a war against Israel and Palestinians against a group of terrorists known as Hamas. The, 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 the whole conflict, and we got to keep it straight, is a conflict against Hamas. Unfortunately, and I pray for the Palestinian people because I personally have met them. I've been there. I've been to the West Bank, and I love these people. I want to make that very clear. Unfortunately, they have been caught in the crossfire, and they have been, uh, they have been used as cannon fodder for this horrible group called Hamas. I have a real problem. A real problem when we have universities that are singing songs, listen, that are singing songs that terrorists are singing in, in order to per perpetuate their, their religion, not just their religion, but their terrorist way of thinking. You know, during World War II, when the Jewish people were put on trains, they were, many times they would go by churches. And as these trains would go by churches, the, the people in these train cars that were being brought to these, these concentration camps would be wailing at the top of their lungs. And the people would be sitting in the churches and they heard this. And the way some of these churches responded was to simply sing louder. I am not going to sing louder and drown out what is going on right now in Israel. Be, mark my words. We have a responsibility to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You have a responsibility to pray for the peace there of our, our Jewish brothers and sisters, of our Palestinian brothers and sisters. We have a responsibility to pray against the terrorism that is going on and not to ignore it. Pray for the peace in that area. Okay, let's jump back to Hebrews. The Israelites were supposed to, at this time, they were supposed to stay committed to God. They were supposed to obey Him. They were supposed to worship Him and worship Him alone. And they were told this. And they said, man, I, we will do this. Yes, amen, hallelujah. Whatever you want, God, we will do this. We will remain strong. And, and God says, look, you do it and I'll bless you. If you go your own way, that's what the covenant was all about. You obey it, God blesses. You don't obey, God says you're going to be cursed. See, God established a sacrificial system where the death of their animal could, could temporarily cover their sin. But as one commentary says, the law under the old covenant was never a means to salvation. Rather, it led to condemnation as people repeatedly broke the law and violated the covenant. They couldn't keep it. They couldn't keep it. But we have a, we have a, a incredible blessing it, through the new covenant, through Jesus, not just that our sins would be covered, but that they would be forgiven, that he has given us access into a relationship with the Father. And for that, we should rejoice. There is a blessing of this relationship. There is a blessing of help. Verse 7 says, for, there had, if, for if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said that the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I will, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. When Israel was given the law, they said, we will, be, we will obey this as I've already said. And God said, that's great. And I'm going to lead you. And he did. He led them by the hand, it says, out of the land of slavery. Similar to, remember this picture where Michelle is, is walking Frankie by the hand. I, I, I had to put it up there again today. Uh, he says, listen, I will, I will lead you. I will guide you. Just follow me. Just remain true to me. But unfortunately, even though they received his guidance, they chose to do his own thing. It, let, let's put this in our context for just a minute. Imagine you had a kid and you as a parent promised them you would take them to this place, La Casa Gelato in Vancouver. I love this place. They've got 238 flavors of ice cream. 
Look at that. Here's, here's a little bit of a picture of some of those flavors. All you got to do, you say to your kid, is you got to finish your homework. Just finish your homework, and away you go. We will take you for some ice cream. Uh, but what happens is they, they get all excited and says, yes, we will do it. But they get on to, into the room, and they start playing around, you know, with one of these things, right? Playing around with their devices and they get sidetracked and they, and after an hour or so you go back in there and says, okay, are we ready to go? Did you get your homework done? Well, you know, not really. I was kind of distracted. And they now are not able to enjoy their ice cream. And now they could say to you, you are so cruel. You are so mean. Why would you do this to me? Whose fault is it? It's not your fault. You made the promise, but they chose not to keep their end of the bargain. And that's what happened to Israel. God made promises and they chose to disregard it. It says, but God found fault with the people because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. C can I ask you this? See, God has made promises to us. And you know, it's crazy because God, he keeps his promises even though at times we don't keep ours. But I tell you, if you want to enjoy the presence and the power and the wonders of God, I'm wondering, are you being, being faithful and maintaining your responsibility? Are you being faithful in your relationship to him? Are you being faithful in your commitments you've made to him? Are you being faithful in doing that which he's asked you to do? See, the promise is that God will help us. He will walk with us. But we've got to be faithful in that. There is a promise of in internal change. Verse 10 says, This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. From that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. You know, a while back, um, President Obama said something very, very interesting. It was this, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. No, no matter how you dress the exterior, no matter how much you make the outside look good, it, when it comes to, to anything, specifically a pig in this, this situation, it's still a pig. And for us, we can put on all the exterior stuff and do all the right stuff, but it's got to come down to what's going on in our heart. Are we living in a way that our heart has changed and that is honoring God? See, I love this because he says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on my heart. He, he's saying, I don't want you just to do the exterior stuff. I want it to be something that is in your your heart. I want to change you from the inside out. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. God wants to do that for you and bring about a change from the inside. And you need to ask God to do that. There is a blessing of eternal, internal change. And lastly, there is a blessing of forgiveness. Verse 11 says this, no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother say, know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. I said it already multiple times. There was no forgiveness under the law. There was just a covering because the law was, point, was there for pointing out our mistakes. In the same way today, the law is there to and put in place to keep us from making bad decisions and pointing out the mistakes we, we make. We drive too fast we broke the law. We get pulled over and we get a speeding ticket. So, but it was only through the sacrifice of Jesus that true forgiveness is possible for all who call on him. Hebrews chapter 11 verse, or sorry, chapter 8 verse 11, it quotes Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 34. It refers to that day when Israel will, will be re reunited with, the with Judah and they shall rejoice in that promised kingdom that they will be one once again. Again, they were split in the Old Testament, but God says, I'm going to bring you back together. For us, for us, it's not just about a kingdom coming back together, but for us, there's a, there's a promise. There's a day coming. There's coming a day, and I'm praying that it comes soon, Lord Jesus, that it comes soon. When we will be aware of God's greatness, when God will reveal himself to us and to the people all around us, when God does miraculous things in our midst, in our churches, in our communities, where 
God begins to do, do a, a, a revival work. And man, I want to see that. I want to see that. Where he reveals himself through signs and through wonders. And, that, and, and people look at it and say, man, that can be nothing but God. Hey, let, let, me, let me jump back to Israel for just a minute here. You, you think about what God has done to protect that nation. Not so very long ago, 300 cruise missiles and ballistic missiles and drones were fired upon that nation. 330 of them is, is the number that I found. 99% were destroyed. And that was not just because they had good shooting, but that was because of the hand of the Almighty God. God protected the nation. And God is still working today. He's bringing people to himself, even in that nation today. It's interesting. I was talking to, to Sharon, who, who has a connection with the, uh, the, the garden tomb. And she said to me that there's so many people wanting to come to the garden tomb in Jerusalem because they want to know about this Jesus. Who is he? And want, they're discovering who he is. God still wants to do great, wonderful new things in our midst today. Verse 13 says, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. See, God, it wants to do new things in your life. He wants to bring freshness in your life. He wants to, he, and from here he's talking about the, the old covenant of, of Moses and, and, and the new covenant under Christ. He's doing, a, he's doing a wonderful new thing, but he wants to do a wonderful new thing in you as well. And I, I, I want to end by asking you, how open are you to what God wants to do in you? How open are you to, to receive that new contract, to, to be willing to abide by that new contract, that new covenant, that new relationship with Jesus? See, we have a responsibility to play. God has given us an opportunity to enjoy Him. We have an opportunity and responsibility to receive Christ and to follow him faithfully. Father, I pray for those that are listening to me today, especially those that may not have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray that they would embrace this new covenant, this new commitment you've made with your people through Jesus, that they would embrace the opportunity to have that relationship with you. And Father, if there are those listening to me that have not made a decision to follow you, I pray they would ask you to forgive them of the things they've done wrong, to accept the, the wonderful gift of your son Jesus, that he died and rose again so that we can have that relationship with you. I pray, God, that you would challenge them to receive you. And for us that have been following you for, for a long time, Father, that you would challenge us to go deeper, to go further, to be more excited about who you are and what you have for us, to be faithful to the commitment you've made to us and be, to be committed to you as well. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, thank you again for joining me this morning. Again, I encourage you, would you please, would you please be so kind to drop me a line? Let me know how you're doing. Love to hear what God's been doing in your life. Love to hear your thoughts on this, on this series, on the book of Hebrews, how God has been challenging you. Love to hear from you. Phone us at the office. Send me an email, whatever way, but love to hear from you. God bless you. Have a great week. Looking forward to seeing you again next week.